Thanks for tuning into Talking Point. I'm your host, Neeraj Shah. The case for a chat today. Well, um, you can argue multiple points which should be the key talking points today. One, whether the India valuation will stay higher for longer because every single time that the markets have had a skittish move, they've come back and climbed the walls of worry and are hitting fresh highs today. Uh, the SMIT correction, is it bottoming out? April thus far has seen mid caps and small caps outperform. It's only three days, but starting to outperform the large caps yet again, despite all the worries about small cap valuations. And of course, BFSI updates, as they're trickling in, do they inspire confidence in the sector? Because that's a big heavyweight. This and a lot more with Amit Sachdeva. He's head of India Equity Strategy at HSBC. Amit, so good having you. It's been a really long time. Thanks for taking the time out. Uh, thanks, Neera. It's always a pleasure to be on your show. And good morning to all the viewers as well. Thank you so much. Thanks so much. Trust me, it's an absolute delight to have you, I must say. So, Amit, uh, let's start off with uh, what your thought is about uh, this, this consistent skepticism that we've uh, heard about uh, the markets and the valuations and the possibility of the correction and how every single time we've the markets have come back and climbed the wall of worry at least thus far sure i think um, it's easy to reflect going back to what we said in the past and and i would start with the same thought and i have reiterated it again and again that indian market has a certain goldilocks scenario and once that sets in it's very difficult to go and if I were to, uh, you know, think about uh, current context is as well. This was decisively set last year. We have seen a major bull run, and we've argued once that momentum sets in, doesn't go away that easily. And small phase of consolidation, in fact, uh, investors use it to in such phases to buy into, uh, you know, uh, this consolidation mode. And that what we're seeing in is basically reflection of that dynamic. Why this is happening is because uh, India's internal construct is very positive the macro earnings even valuation i would argue uh, one can they are excesses and they are uh, tolerable valuations and this earnings and and you know obviously this dynamic of risk tolerance in the market continues with it which reflects in a uh, small and mid cap majorly outperforming last year but small bit of panic for example a correction happens and then people start to sort of write obituary of that small and mid cap space as well we've always cautioned that one must uh, stay cautious on the overarching uh, mid and small caps construct because they have run way ahead of his own bull market scenarios and one has to be maintaining bit caution. But we also said in this note was that we are not in 2018 style correction in mid caps as well. Uh, if you recall in 2018, when the correction sets in mid cap, small caps corrected basically 30% odd and market also was down 7, 8%. So it was a major bearish phase uh, but at the same time, the context then was very, very negative. We had even ILFS, you know, crisis, uh, you know, as well in that year. The U.S. bond yields were rising. Uh, growth was slowing down. There was a major earning downgrades happening. If you put the current context, none of that is in the picture. So although there is an expensiveness debate will continue, but my, my sense is that we are in a decisively positive phase and that that is the reason that you see these small phases of consolidation, but market rebound very quickly. And I think that phase will persist for a decent length of time as well. And that's the reason we continue to be very positive on Indian market. So, uh, uh, Amit, uh, most, if not all, but like I can say with conviction that 95% of the AMCs as well as the your peers on the sell side that I speak to are negative mm. mid-cap, small caps positive large caps as a stance uh, while being in agreement that the real growth story over the next three years will be in the mid caps and small caps. Are you advocating to your large clients as well to be uh, overweight large caps and underweight mid caps and small caps in the near term? I think Neeraj, that's a, yeah, that's a good And I think that's what we have been also advocating since uh, last few months is that large capital space last year uh, was major laggard, right? I like to put uh, you know, for example, mid cap space, mid cap space, uh, and small cap space outperform the market majorly, and large cap space relatively lag. So there's a there's a relative pocket of value, and how much that is, let me just uh, phrase it. Typically in bull runs, we've seen that small and mid cap space is typically 1.4x the market run. Right, this time it was 2x the market run, way ahead of fundamentals. We also noticed that 
peak valuation of mid cap space over the market is about 35 40% right and that was that you know premium bills in there's a very less tolerance of that premium holding at that level so it comes down now if you see that when the year uh, began and then we seen small mid cap correction uh, we've seen that premium come down to about 17% right and, and the market breadth for mid caps also was 73 so it became much more tolerable so what we've been saying is that large cap space uh, relative to mid cap space and small cap as an average basket tends to offer certain superior pockets of value while one has to be increasingly cautious buying into momentum in certain small and mid caps to avoid uh, you know large scale corrections if say for example there's a major global risk off happens or some other event happens food touches 100 and all the rest of it and bond yields continue to stay very high there's a whole lot of negative context for equities then you could see that you know some correction could be very stark so one has to also brace up for those uncertainties if i may say so on balance our view is that uh, you know small and mid caps are not in that 2018 style correction so can we use to buy into sell off but also large cap offers slightly better value but also not to forget that fi flows became negative at the beginning of the year fi flows come back uh, we'll also see that has a tilt towards large caps as well so that also you should keep that in mind mm, yeah you know, and, and viewers, the other point that Amit is making that the earnings expectations, uh, whatever uh, mid-teens, is a lot more realistic this time around than what it may have been the last time we had a very steep correction. So that's to be kept in mind as well. Um, but yeah, just yeah, just one small point, uh, Amit extended this conversation on mid-caps before we move on to specific themes. Um, when I look at um, your model portfolios or the or the model ideas that you guys give out, right? It re the, the range um, is very interesting and some of those ideas are very different in that, I mean, not everybody goes for, um, as, as a top idea, this, this jewelry name that you guys have. Not everybody goes in for a railway stock as a top idea after the rally that we've already seen for some of these stocks in the last 12 odd months. Mm -hmm. So what, what, what gives, what's happening here? So look, uh, you know, uh, I, I'm, 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 I assume that you're referring to our mid-cap uh, style note, which we put together key ideas in the mid-cap space. So I would refrain from definitely discussing any individual name. We are not allowed. To Agree. But what, what, what I want to say is that our view that I explained that how we think about mid-cap is that deep correction unlikely, and some of the mid-cap's name are long-range themes. Okay. They are multi-year themes, okay. for example. Okay. And then, you know, what happens in this scenario is when market is in risk-taking mode, uh, market tends to identify those opportunities which are multi-decade stories, multi-year stories. Mm -hmm. and, and, and these corrections become a good point to buy into it. So market is looking for next mid-cap idea or a next large-cap idea. And that is the quest that continues to go on and on. So reflecting that thought, we, some of the ideas that you see in that list uh, qualify for that uh, bucket as well. And that's the reason you see that diverse range of, of ideas. But but it has a certain guiding principle that one of that guiding principle is that. Okay. Well, and, and not a bad way to think about things, viewers. Uh, if you indeed want to be in that space, then try and think, expand the horizon and try and look at the decadal opportunity or the multi-year opportunity as the case may be. I want to start off with something that is a bit of a recency bias, uh, Amit, and that is... Uh, uh, the BFSI updates as they've started to trickle in. I mean, HDFC Bank rejoicing is one case in point, but we saw deposit growths being healthy for a clutch of uh, uh, banking names. Um, so banks and NBFCs, Q1 updates thus far, are looking pretty decent. Uh, does, is that strong enough a reason for this hibernation in performance uh, to reverse mm. of sorts? Uh, as I said, that I would reserve my comments at a very broad level. But if you come and think of it, and if I reflect on the last piece we published on our radar and sector preferences, uh, we noticed that uh, banks uh, or the largely financial space has definitely seen uh, dynamics turning negative, investors' optimism being more pessimism, there was a sell off, and all the rest of it. Sector has sort of accumulated some apathy, if I, if I may say. And that, that's the reason the sector has moved to a quadrant that we define as a risk-on quadrant. Uh, what does that tell us? Is risk-on quadrant is where the investors are already pessimistic and business dynamics continue to be negative. 
So as and and that uh, that quadrant is very interesting. For example, if market wants to buy a risk with a two-year view, uh, in that sense, market then starts to value those opportunities with a small improvement in output, et cetera. So my sense is that is a very interesting bucket to watch out for, and, uh, and hence banks and financials as well. As the market tolerance for risk rises, uh, I would say at some stage, that makes a case for uh, some sort of preference for those as well. But market, uh, in the, given the market is sort of mixed, one has to play all the opportunities as a blend of all opportunities. For example, a risk on bucket, but also momentum bucket, but also that structurally winning bucket. So I would probably uh, have a balanced risk view in the current market rather than just go all out and buy all the risk or ball out, uh, go out and buy all the momentum. So I think the prudent strategy for us has been in the way we have selected our, our top ideas is, is to manage that sort of quantum of risk. And hence, banks, although it has sort of slipped to our risk on bucket, uh, one has to take a slightly longer view not a shorter term view, uh, but still it could be part of the uh, risk thinking here. Okay, and I, I mean, uh, I'm just using the names as an example. I do not want you to comment on those, but I'm just sure. trying to sure. ask you, uh, would your preference list have the larger names and some of those, you know, old quality names which haven't performed hitherto, uh, at least haven't performed on the bourses. They may have done reasonably okay fundamentally, but haven't mm. quite performed. Or is the preference towards, say, mid-sized private banks, or is the preference towards PSUs, which have performed thus far, but on the valuation front mm -hmm. might still be okay? I think our, you know, its preference is clear in the way our stock picks have been, and I think our banks analysts would be the best to comment on specific ideas. But clearly, we are we are positive on some of the large cap names. Okay, that's that's a uh, that, that that's one quiz. And I just want to round off this. Uh, 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 BFSI piece uh, and, and viewers post the break we'll talk about some of the other pieces and then wrap up the conversation with Amit's view on what the global macro suggests but just rounding off this piece before we take that break Amit on financials non-lending financials what's the sense there from capital markets to insurance to what have you uh, is that a pocket uh, to be overweight on? Well our view is that it's still in that bucket is stuck in that zone uh, where one has to uh, you know take a bit of a risk on position there so i think we stick to financials as a, as a within the financial bucket our preferences towards a larger bank space now we shift focus to consumption and before i get in my colleague bahima just a word from amit on what where is it that hsbc believes uh, people should play consumption or how is it that hsbc believes people should play consumption amit this is a question. I mean, hitherto we've seen the K-shaped consumption theme play out, wherein the upper end of the K, which is the premium consumption, did very well. Staples haven't. Yeah. Retail has been ho hum. Maybe a trend did well. Some of the others did not. I'm just trying to understand how are you guys advocating that investors should play consumption in India? Look, I think that's a great question, and everybody has that question in their mind. That. Uh, consumption clearly has shown two spectrums, one part of consumption doing really well and one part of consumption is very weak. And if you recall, we had portion on FMCG style consumption a while ago uh, that that piece seems quite, uh, you know, uh, not well placed and stocks have corrected as well. My sense is that demand situation continues to be a little tepid. As such, from staples or as a general basket, I think near-term recovery is, is still questionable, and we had several pockets of consumption. For example, QSRs, and uh, you know, if you look at uh, even apparel and a few other even discretionary consumption at the mass end is also uh, impacted. So, so our view has been that, for example, retailers are a good way to play uh, some of these uh, periods of uh, you know tepid consumption where there's a structural growth, where there's a network rollout let go. Where the business models are winning, I'm not specifically, you know, guiding for any particular stock. What I was trying to say is that our view was where the growth is uh, almost very structural. Growth is easy to come by. Growth doesn't seem uh, undeterred, uh, you know, and and that kind of you know a dynamic is needed for performing in the current context. For example, obviously there's a rural has been an issue, and uh, you know sometimes you know urban demand has been an issue as well. So it, it's a mixed take. So our view is that. Uh, there's a large opportunity uh, where there's a structural growth, where there's a winning business model, uh, and uh, where we see demonstrated consistent performance. That's the kind of stocks we have picked. 
we have stayed away from largely staples uh, you know in in the current cycle but at the same time you know uh, once there's a larger correction there and there's a demand take, takes a turn which we think that somewhere may happen next year but it's too early to call that out uh, so i feel that the consumption basket seems very interesting uh, market would value a structural delivery of growth where the growth remains consistent growth remains uh, you know above average market would really value that Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay, for some people, it's a bit of a return to growth. And uh, talking about Avenue Supermarts in particular individually today, not with Amit, but with my colleague Mahima, because uh, in a bro uh, the brokerages have come out with a very uh, chalk and cheese view on what they make of Avenue Supermarts numbers. But what were the numbers? Mahima Johnson uh, to talk about that and the brokerage updates. Mahima. Right, uh, Neerad. So uh, the the business update that came in suggests that the revenue is estimated to rise 20% uh, YOY. Now for Q4 FY24, the revenue is around 12,300 crores, which was 10,300 crores in FY23. In terms of store addition, this quarter has had the highest um, count of store additions, around 24. So now the total store count stands at around 365. Now even in terms of stock performance, where well, the stock has seen been in a recovery mode uh, in 2023, around May 18, it was at its 52-week low of uh, 33,500. Uh, sorry, my bad, uh, 3352. And now today, the stock price is around uh, 4400. So the stock has been on a recovery mode. Now, what you can expect um, based the Q4 results were uh, some kind of margin expansion, some kind of improvement in the product mix, the demand trends in the apparel segment is something that should be uh, on the radar to watch out for in the same store sales growth. Now, what um, are the brokerages saying about this? Well, the city uh, note on Avenue Supermars uh, says that it maintains sales with a target price of uh, 3,200. They've upgraded this target price from 3,100. They're, they're saying that the Q3 part was 4% lower uh, basis their estimates and the average revenue per squ uh, square foot has fallen by 10%. Now, uh, this this uh, fall in the revenue per square feet uh, is continues to impact. The uh, continues to be impacted because of the inferior product mix and uh, second, the store additions that are taking place are taking place in the smaller towns. There was also a Macquarie note that says that they are encouraged by the healthy sales momentum in DMART, which uh, bolsters their belief in the uh, value proposition that the DMART offers. And lastly, there was a Morgan Stanley note which suggests that the improving trends in growth and efficiency metrics support their thesis for DMART. However, their ability to re-engineer growth with a grocery first strategy will be on their radar. So this is the overall street view that uh, is there on Avenue Supermarts. Okay, uh, Mahima, thanks a lot for that. So that's the view on retail, of course, uh, and what others have also said about retail uh, and, and what the numbers for Avenue Supermarts have looked like. Uh, Amit has given, expressed some thoughts around consumption and retail already. Amit, I want to, uh, we have about six, five minutes on the show. I want to kind of bring in the global picture into perspective. Um, are you sanguine about global growth and therefore could globally linked sectors uh, do better than what the market currently fears uh, them to do? Well, I think global uh, picture continues to be slightly uncertain, right? In, in, in some sense, demand scenario and the way, uh, you know, several pockets of economies are still grappling under fears of recessions and all these things. So that picture remains mixed. That said, I think uh, that's the reason actually, if you look at the one thing to watch out for actually from a global scenario is rather than global growth, I would probably think that they are global risk we need to watch out for, right? Because uh, what's happening with crude or what's happening because the US bond yields would have a larger uh, overlay on Indian market as well in the coming months. If, for example, the expectations of rate cuts in the Fed, what happens in the second half, for example, if the geopolitical situation, how it evolves and, for example, in, in the Middle East and how the crude sort of behaves in a manner that would also weigh. I think these are the also larger global macro factors uh, needed we need to watch out for. Well, some obviously growth uh, in, in external sectors that uh, these are various pockets of it. Pharma could be another and, you know, IT could be another and there are different uh, drivers of it. And, and you know, uh, but at the same time, uh, you know, I would probably think that from a global macro context, we need to worry about these two aspects as well. Okay. Uh, within those worries, is there a silver lining though? I mean, I'm just trying to understand uh, the manufacturing numbers across the board. India manufacturing PMI looking very strong. China data starting to look up a little bit. Europe not too bad. Is there a silver lining? Uh, could manufacturing link themes uh, do better than feared or would you still be on the sidelines? 
So we like manufacturing like themes in India and you know uh, some of the names that we mentioned in our top ideas also are linked with those themes you know and 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 uh, but at the same time there, there's a overarching context also we need to account for. Got it. Okay. Amit, uh, I, I, I uh, appreciate you taking the time out and speaking to us today. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much uh, for being with us and look forward to talking to you soon. Thanks, Neeraj. Thank you for having me here. Yeah, Thanks no, not at all. Well, that's Amit Sachdeva of HSBC. Now, viewers, the other thing that uh, I just wanted to bring out before we wrap up this uh, conversation, uh, and, and which is what, again, was a result of uh, the note that they have put out. They say that uh, on the mid-cap side, mid-cap valuations have come down to the five-year mean, and the mid-cap market breadth has declined to 73% from 90%, which is when they wrote the note a few days back at the beginning of the year. And all of this signals some potential downside, but limited. So I think the crux of today's talking point has been, especially because they wrote this note, is that while there is so much of fear around mid caps and small caps, maybe just maybe the downsides fundamentally based on average valuations in the past and current are limited. Maybe the macro and the data that we have also points towards that downside being limited. And I don't know if the market is, I'm not predicting this, but all I'm saying is with the market returns thus far in April, uh, or maybe even be before April, when uh, we came out of a slightly brutal, quick, swift sell off in the mid caps and small caps, the turn has been largely in favor. Now, will this last? Anybody's guess. But for now, the market does seem to be rewarding bottom up growth stories and not differentiating too much between what is the market cap of a particular company. That's all that we have on this edition of The Talking Point. Thanks so much for tuning in.